Want a field day for the heat down there A thousand people in the street Singing songs and they carry it time Mostly saying hooray for our side There's a battle lines being drawn Nobody's right if everybody wrong When people speak in their mind Getting so much resistance from behind We got to stop children, what's that sound? Oh, everybody looks good and down This is Lauren Steiner with The Robust Opposition. Welcome to my show. I haven't done an interview show in quite a while, so I'm very pleased to be back with a guest that I've had on before, and that is Danny Haifang. How you doing, Danny? I'm doing well, Lauren. Thanks for having me. Sure. So we're here to talk about Danny's book, which is called American Exceptionalism and American Innocence, A People's History of Fake News from the Revolutionary War to the War on Terror. And this is a book that he wrote with his co-author, Roberto Servent, who is a um, PhD, JD, a professor of political science and social ethics at Hope International University in Fullerton. And Danny is an activist and a regular contributor to the Black Agenda Report. Let's get right into the book. First, define the terms American exceptionalism and American innocence. Define them broadly. Explain why they're myths and why you use the current term fake news to describe how these myths have been propagated. American exceptionalism briefly is defined in our book as the myth that the United States is a force for good in the world. And American innocence is usually kicked in. It usually comes in when American exceptionalism is critiqued. So American innocence is this notion that regardless of what the United States does, regardless of the actual facts on the ground, the conditions that exist in both U.S. society and the world, that the United States is always innocent and that it is always the victim. And so American innocence is what imparts evil motives to the U.S.'s supposed enemies, domestic and uh, foreign, uh, while creating a situation where the rulers of the system are um, benevolent and can never do any wrong. So American exceptionalism and American innocence are interrelated. And we use the term fake news um, to uh, contextualize American exceptionalism and American innocence. Basically what we say is that uh, rather than use the uh, definitions of fake news propagated by Hillary Clinton and uh, people like Bob Mueller, we you say that American exceptionalism and American innocence are fake news and uh, these myths uh, of exceptionalism and innocence that uh, characterize the United States are really holding us back from understanding the truth um, of our situation and also holding us back from acting upon it. You say that the Western notions of freedom, liberty, individual rights, and property are all bound up with the enslavement of the racialized other. Talk about how that was applied to Native Americans uh, during the original uh, ethnic cleansing and then um, African slaves. We use the seminal works of people like Roxanne and Bartiz to really discuss how the foundations of the United States are rooted in the genocide of indigenous people. This is you know, more well known than it used to be. However, uh, what many people don't know is how foundational it actually was to the very formation of the United States, how uh, indigenous people themselves had actually a lot of alliances with of the supposed enemies of, of the original colonies because indigenous people were looking for freedom and were looking for the ability to maintain their lands. And so one of the uh, provisions in the Declaration of Independence even uh, stated that uh, these savage natives were one of, a huge problem in maintaining the uh, benevolent and in creating the benevolent American Republic. And when it comes to the enslavement of Africans, uh, this was just as seminal to the foundation of the United States. And what many people don't know is that even when it is acknowledged that slavery was foundational to the United States, many people still think that the American Revolution itself was a progressive revolution and that slavery was the uh, inherited 
system that uh, the founding fathers uh, didn't really like, but they maintained it because it was a necessary evil. However, what we say is that there's evidence in people's works like Gerald Horn that shows in historically documents how the American Revolution was actually fought to preserve slavery, that slavery was actually becoming more and more costly for the British Empire, and it was seeking to reduce and maybe eliminate the trade in slaves, maybe the entire practice of slavery, but the trade in slaves was becoming so costly uh, and that there was going to be a reduction. That's exactly what um, Britain, Great Britain did um, afterward, but that really precipitated this uh, incipient trend, this desire among the colonists to become free from the British crown. Okay, so the media of the day needed to create these myths, this fake news, uh, to make the settlers look like the victims instead of the aggressors that they were. And, you know, they also talked about the land as unoccupied. And when I was reading that, it put me in mind of the creation myth of Israel, how they said that was an unoccupied land, forgetting about the fact that there were 700,000 Palestinians that they use very similar tactics. The Irgun was a terrorist organization by Menachem Begin uh, to um, uh, you know, rid the, the countryside of the Palestinians, ethnic cleansing. Talk about how that was accomplished in the United States. Well, similar to Israel, where its military was the product of mercenary colonial, settler colonial activity, uh, the War Department, which is what the Department of Defense used to be called, uh, was a creation in the United States of scalping, mercenary activity, and uh, not many people know that the original colonies uh, prior to independence actually um, hired out mercenaries uh, and slave patrols to conduct defense against rebellious Africans and um, in order to restore the land of indigenous people. And so that the only way that could be accomplished was by dehumanizing these populations. So natives were savages, Africans were inherently subhuman who needed to be civilized through the practice of slavery. And we talk a lot in the book about how uh, there is a pervasive narrative in the United States that, and, and we talk about this with the Colin Kaepernick situation, that slaves uh, and former slaves and, and, and black people still to today should appreciate what the United States has given them um, despite the slavery and despite the, the, consist the persistent effects of that history into today. Okay, so in your book, um, everything that we have been taught to believe for good and pure reasons is actually for imperialism and economic gain. And we're fast forwarding a little bit to World War II, uh, but you even challenged the belief that World War II was a good war uh, by talking about how until 1941, Americans actually did business with the Nazis because it was profitable and how they were seen as a bulwark against Bolshevism. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, and it's something that I, I'm really passionate about. I think it's a huge part of our book because even into today, people like Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, Bernie Sanders, and, and, and many people on the progressive side of the political spectrum see World War II as an example when the United States stepped up to the plate for good, not only good intentions, but also good results in terms of the defeat of fascism. What we talk about in the book is uh, a lot of what you already said, but uh, a key component to this was how the United States, uh, before entering the World uh, War II formally in 1941, um, its biggest industrialists, its biggest corporatists and capitalists, we're talking about the Henry Fords, we're talking about the Prescott Bushes, uh, these folks uh, were financing Hitler's political campaign and then um, his uh, ability to militarily uh, produce a society capable of challenging the Soviet Union, which was actually seen as the biggest threat to future U.S. superiority, because the United States, uh, many people should know that uh, the ruling class in the United States was really looking at how it was going to become ascendant based upon the destruction that 
World War II was going to impose upon Europe and upon uh, the entire Eastern uh, part of the world. And so um, the Soviet Union ended up losing 27 million lives and actually fighting the uh, bulk of the war against Nazism. But still to today, we are told that the United States when it entered actually was what defeated both Nazi Germany and uh, Japan and its um, fallen empire. There are a lot of crimes that the United States committed in World War II. One of which we focus on is the firebombing of Dresden. And we also talk about the US use to nuclear bombs uh, during World War II against Japan. When historians both see both of those events, mainstream historians see both of those events as totally unnecessary to the effort of one, causing Japan to surrender because Japan had already been defeated militarily and the Soviet Union was marching that way. The same was happening in Germany. The Soviet Union was marching, the Red Army was marching um, toward Dresden. And so the US and the UK wanted to show the Soviet Union what it could do with its uh, newfound military superiority. And that's, the military industrial complex really does come out of World War II because the US spent lots and lots of money building up the defenses of the UK as well as um, the United States. And you also talk about how um, the strike on Pearl Harbor was not necessarily to liberate Japan, but to prevent it from colonizing East Asia. So it's like, <clears throat> one has to wonder, after reading this book, if we have ever used our military for good in this, in this world. Now, you talk a lot about your book um, about black internationalism, and this was a movement that tried to push back against militarism and imperialism, and this was a movement that got crushed. Can you talk a little bit about, just like whet the people's appetites for some of the players in that movement, what that stood for, and what we did to push back against them, and then we can talk about some parallels to what's happening today. Sure, black internationalism is a broad political framework that has had many different formations and many different organizational uh, manifestations and political movements uh, represented um, within uh, the Black American experience. But one uh, individual that we talk about is Paul Robeson. In our chapter about Russia, we really call on the work of Paul Robeson. Not many people know that his children were raised and educated in the Soviet Union. Not many people know that he was not only a member of the Communist Party, but also he uh, was ruthlessly attacked by the McCarthyist uh, anti-communist hysteria that uh, during the mid 20th century was so pervasive in the United States. And that during his um, tenure of being attacked where he was blacklisted from both Hollywood and the music industry uh, and ultimately his passports were revoked so he could not travel uh, he still did not, not only did he not revoke his membership of the Communist Party and say he rebuked it, or were, he wouldn't even answer questions about that, seeing them as illegitimate, but he would ask the question of why working class people, and why black people in particular, should see the Soviet Union as their enemy, when in fact the United States has been the one not only to uh, back the forces of colonialism that were ravaging the African continent, but also keeping Black Americans in the United States in a state of racial terror um, under the regimes of Jim Crow and um, you know endless uh, poverty and uh, second-class citizenship. So really, that's what who we channel when we talk about where do we need to go from here? How do we need to look at American exceptionalism, what it represents, but also how do we look at our responses and and how, what lessons do we need to take? from those who are always talking about the unexceptional nature of the U.S. Uh, system. Well, it's been challenged, I was talking about today in today's society, it's sort of been challenged by Colin Kaepernick. Something that I didn't kn know, that that standing was actually a new policy and it was paid for by the military. And that's why they came, so, uh, came down so hard on Kaepernick. Can you talk about that and also the role of military, not just in professional sports, but also in movies and mm -hmm. other areas, and that's how um, they perpetrate these myths? Right, the militarization of U.S. society has been so important to the preservation of American exceptionalism, to 
Um, you, what the ruling class has done in the United States is to use the military as a symbol of American greatness and American power projection, both domestically and abroad. And this, there are so many examples of this. Uh, there were leaked documents just a few years ago that showed over 1,800 films and movies and television shows were um, actively intervened upon by both the Defense Department and uh, related intelligence agencies. Uh, when we look at the NFL, we know that millions of dollars uh, come from the Defense Department, from the Pentagon, um, to fund what even John McCain, who was looking to uh, implement austerity measures um, not too long ago, um, yeah, I think it was 2009, who challenged this uh, notion of quote unquote paid patriotism that the, youth, that the Pentagon should not be doing out dollars to. Uh, NFL, the NFL to force players to stand for the national anthem, that this was a poor use of military dollars. So uh, that contradiction of itself is quite humorous, given that he is such a, he was such a war hawk. But it just show, goes to show how pervasive uh, the U.S. military is in all aspects of life. And, and we can go from our police departments, which now support um, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of military weaponry. Um, and in the Colin Kaepernick situation, what was interesting about it was his protest wasn't really a protest against militarism per se. Uh, what he was protesting was the oppression of black people in the United States. He said it very forthrightly. And in his original protest, he actually completely sat out of the national anthem. So it wasn't even a meal for it. It was a much more um, really radical gesture from what it became. But just by challenging the anthem, just by challenging the, the, the sanctity of the national anthem as a symbol of American exceptionalism and military uh, power project projection, he was responded to in such a harsh way by those in the NFL, the ownership, um, and those who profit from it um, by being blacklisted entirely. Now you talk about um the role of corporate sports, and there was that quote about black athletes being the new prisoners. Um, quote, sports owners exercise control over the labor of blacks for purposes of extracting profit, even if their labor is paid. And then I think there was a quote from a team owner. And then uh, there was another quote from Samantha B about the irony of talking about people on field, you know? So the, the um, comparison to slaves and prisoners, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? What we're really talking about is how um, professional athletics, sporting leagues in the United States, especially the major sporting leagues, really do exploit uh, black uh, labor in order to extract enormous profit. And a lot of this profit is really going to the corporate media um, as well as the um, owners and the stadium owners. And there is a real need, especially, you know, I, I was actually just thinking about this with the Kevin Bryant situation, and I know you're in California, so I'm sure that there are some conversations about this. But when we look at someone like Kevin Durant, his career, we, we can see how his, despite the millions of dollars that he makes, despite all, despite how he's heralded as one of the best basketball players, maybe never play the game, if he wasn't going to help the NBA make super profits for his just existence in the NBA finals, uh, he wasn't worth anything. So he was forced to come back early from an injury and he injured it. He injured his leg even more and who knows what he's going to be like in the future. So that there's just this example of, it doesn't matter. The, the patronage that's paid out to athletes does not matter. What matters is that there is still this system this corporate capitalist racist system that's dictating um, even the most so-called privileged sectors of oppressed uh, populations like America. Yeah, now Dave Zirin has written some articles about how uh, the NCAA and unpaid athletes, college athletes are exploited. They extract all their labor to make money for the teams and the media. Uh, but they're struggling to get through school. They're passing them through classes. They're, you know, some of them that, 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 that don't even have places to live and proper nutrition. I mean, it's horrible. Um, that really sounds like slavery to me. 
uh, the American dream versus the American reality. You have a chapter on that where you talk about the meritocracy myth and you speak of Obama and Oprah and Jay-Z and people who have managed to get ahead um, and how that really ignores uh, the oppression, the continued oppression of African-Americans in this country. Explain why that is so insidious, that particular myth of the meritocracy. What has ended up happening over the last 40 years as this uh, myth has become so pervasive and really a crutch because um, what the condition of not only Black Americans, but all of working people in the United States um, have become are so um, completely decrepit and in such decline um, in terms of the stagnant wages and the complete usurpation of whatever wealth that working people uh, let alone black people have in the United States um, has become so uh, low that the myth of the American dream really creates a scenario where the neoliberal conditions that face workers are washed away. And what we are left with is um, these myths of you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps, um, as if you individually work hard, you can make it. And just look, Jay-Z exists and look, Barack Obama made it to the to the White House, uh, you can do it too. Uh, when the reality shows that by 2053, if current trends persist, and we know that trends are also affected by economic crises, so this number may be an underestimation, but in 2053, Black America will have a median net worth of zero. Mm. That is quite devastating when we think about how much celebrities like Jay-Z and Oprah and people like Barack Obama are promoted to show that the United States is a more civilized and a more uh, reformed and a, and a more perfect nation for even its most oppressed groups. I, I think it's quite damning what the reality shows. I love learning about how the labor movement changed from before World War II when we know the labor movement was very radical. There were strikes all the time. The Socialist Party was very active. Um, and then it all sort of changed after World War II. It seemed like these union leaders started capitulating uh, and cooperating with uh, the corporations they were working with. They were um, not anti-war at all. They were not aligned with African-Americans. There were a lot of unions that wouldn't accept um, black people in them. I remember reading about how George McGovern, who I supported, of course, I was too young to vote in 1972, but one of the reasons he lost was that George Meany from the AFL-CIO actively worked against him. Uh, what hypothesis do you have for what happened to the labor movement and why? Because uh, we've seen since then, they've lost a percentage. You know, they've, they've allowed themselves to be beaten back, it seems, to the point where they per, were perhaps one of the only forces that could have uh, challenged capitalism. Uh, my hypothesis really begins with the fact that there was a short period in the United States where the contradictions of its white supremacist and capitalist system were really challenged both globally and domestically. And that was during the um, economic crisis of 1929 um, and also the socialist revolution in, this, in Russia, 1917. And so during this period, what we saw was an increase in heightened um, sensitivity uh, among workers and a, a more of an empathy towards the cause of socialism. And so the Communist Party, for example, uh, began to really pick up steam in the labor movement. And that led to a lot more militant actions all the way up until uh, the uh, beginning of the post-war period, which really did force a lot of concessions from capitalists to um, ensure that workers would not go the way of the Soviet Union and would not think about uh, real power in the United States. And so my hypothesis is that both uh, repression, whereby um, organizations, even the Congress of Industrial Organizations, uh, their leadership purged a lot of communist elements, organizers who did a lot of work to make the labor movement militant, they were thrown out they, uh, with the McCarthyite um, anti-communist Red Scare. And uh, then with the transition, the reforms that were made during the New Deal period up until the post-war period, 
uh, really cemented this labor management cooperation uh, model, whereby unions were more concerned with um, ensuring uh, negotiated contracts that could be upheld by law, rather than looking towards militant um, action to ensure that workers really had power in the workplace. And so um, over the next, let's say, beginning 1947, up until um, the neoliberal, uh, the beginnings of neoliberalism in the mid-1970s, um, the labor movement ended up becoming an or a, a mass organization for negotiating with Hamas. Mm -hmm. with Hamas and left it unprepared, um, wholly in, in the most um, broad sense, unprepared for the challenges that would come beginning when the neoliberal period began in the 70s. And so, you know, all that is to say that uh, the contradictions of capitalism really did impact the labor movement. Um, but at the same time, labor leadership has to be held accountable because to this day, as you probably know, Lauren, as many of your viewers may know, a lot of labor leadership is in the pocket of the Democratic Party. And that really began when labor unions decided that um, at the top, decided that um, it was much better to negotiate deals with uh, employers rather than seek to control and seek power in the workplace. And, and I think that's where a lot of the weaknesses of, unfortunately, the labor movement ar arise. And American exceptionalism plays a huge role in this because this whole myth of the golden age of capitalism, right? A lot of the concessions that were fought for and won by all this militant action were uh, promoted by a lot of labor leadership, uh, by employers, by the media, as a result of benevolence uh, by the U.S. capitalist system as a whole. And the labor movement, unfortunately, fell into that trap. And that comes with all the racism and all the contradictions, which um, the labor movement is still struggling with today. And that benevolism was also applied to slaves. You know, there was a great story in there where somebody was touring, um, you know, they did tours of the plantations and they were saying, but weren't the masters nice to their slaves? And she was kind of amazed by these questions that kept coming up. It's like people need to believe these myths in order to justify, you know, how they could, I don't know, cognitive dissonance, live, live in a country like that. And, you know, it puts me in mind the story about labor um, you know, puts me in mind just the recent history, like we had the American Spring in 20, in the spring of um, 2011, before the Arab Spring, before Occupy, when the all the workers converged on Wisconsin, the state capital in Wisconsin, because of Scott Walker trying to get rid of collective bargaining. You know, I remember listening to people that were being interviewed that said, why do these union workers want to get these good salaries and benefits? We private workers don't get that. And I was thinking, wow, look at this mentality that's out there. And so instead of the union workers going around educating people, why when you build up unions, you build up everyone, they put all their attention into this Tom Barrett race, who was the Democrat who was running to take on, you know, Scott Walker. And then they had the recall and the recall lost. And apparently 30 percent of the people that voted against recalling Scott Walker were union members. They need to cre create working class consciousness within union memberships, uh, apparently. Yeah. I want to veer over to your chapter about free speech. Um, and whose free speech the government is protecting. Because that's another myth. I related to this because I was actually arrested for live streaming the poor people's campaign's disruption of the um, proceedings of the Senate in the California State Capitol. And I was the first one they targeted before they even protested the actual, arrested the actual protesters. They arrested me because they wanted me to stop streaming what they were about to do. So um, you have a quote in there that says, the degree of freedom that they enjoy is exactly proportional to the actual threat they pose. The corporate state actually came down very hard on the Black Panthers, not because of any militant activities they were doing, but because of your the free breakfast program. That was the real threat. Can you talk about that? Yeah, the FBI had labeled the Black Panther Party the greatest threat to the internal security of the United States 
that was the huge reason why. It was the notion that uh, there might, there was black independent political activity that challenged the prevailing social order in the United States, which really gave the FBI and the broader, because this was a Coenzo Pro, some people say it's just an FBI operation, but it really did involve the entire U.S. national security state and actually laid the framework for the universalization of surveillance, which exists today, where, you know, you give your example, but a lot of the technologies used by the state today through surveillance of our uh, electronic communication systems and how we communicate um, through acts like the Patriot Act, a lot of that um, was really based upon what the FBI and related intelligence agencies and the, and the U.S. Um, military state as a whole was experimenting with in their suppression of groups like the Black Panther Party. And so, you know, we argue that the assassination, the counterinsurgency warfare, the imprisonment of leaders, the assassination of leaders in the Black Panther Party uh, was indicative of not only the myth of free speech, but also how this notion, this debate that was occurring around the time we were writing the book on college campuses, right wing uh, figures like Milo Yiannopoulos were being brought on and um, there was opposition to that. And while we weren't saying that it is um, obviously wrong to protest bigotry and to protest those figures, we have to look at, well, who is actually enacting and enforcing this so-called myth of free speech? So when we look back at history at uh, what the Black Panther Party went through and continues to go through if we look at people like Mumia Abu-Jamal who remain in prison for their activity um, in the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Movement um, more broadly, we see that the real question is, well, if we want free speech, if we want the ability to assemble, if we want the ability to organize, if we want these kind of civil liberties, we have to look at who exactly and what exactly is enforcing them because uh, ultimately these terms are meaningless if we're living under a power structure which sees its preservation as much more important than any of these individual rights that were really just to preserve the rule of uh, the slave owning class and the capitalist class, um, you know, all the way up into today. Well, you know, you talk about in the book how the House on American Activities Committee, uh, with, I don't remember if it was Paul Robeson, but somebody said, um, you know, here you are, a body of white supremacists for the most part, asking me about if I'm a communist, where you haven't in 20 years investigated the KKK. You know, we know with Occupy, I was part of the Occupy movement. And in Los Angeles, you know, they were pretty brutal against the Occupy protesters when they came and they raided the camp. And we know that this happened after, you know, a few months and they started to see that we were dug in and they were like, oh no, this cannot be. And it was that conversation that Department of Homeland Security had with 28 Democratic mayors and after that, like all of the Occupy encampments were shut down. And you, of course, remember the image of the peaceful protesters locking arms on the campus of the University of California, Davis, and how they were pepper sprayed by those cops. And But now the form, I think, is, is taking in terms of censorship of social media. They allow these right-wing groups on social media Yet, you know, because Facebook and Google uses the Atlantic Council, a right wing neocon think tank to censor, um, you know, to determine what is fake news. And last summer they pulled off 800 pages, most of them, you know, left, legitimate left wing uh, activists and independent journalists. You talk about how uh, exceptionalism and imperialism sort of decayed a little bit after the Iraq war when it became clear that that was fake news, that they had weapons of mass destruction and it was very embarrassing for our country. Um, but then you talk about how they used Obama and what you call the politics of inclusion to repair the damage. Why do you call him the Trojan horse of American imperialism? We call him that in the book because 
right around the time during his the first uh, election campaign um, he was running in, we had a real crisis in the United States, economically and militarily. Economically, the financial system had crashed and the jobs of millions as well as the homes of millions of people had been lost and the economic condition of the United States was in tatters. And we had, as you were saying, the illegitimacy of Bush Jr.'s wars and his administration's wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, which were viewed as endless wars, which were, uh, you know, uh, giving away trillions of dollars uh, to fight wars that were based on lies. And this had domestic consequences, not only with the war fatigue, which we saw in 2016 played a hand in Hillary Clinton's loss um, to Donald Trump, but also in terms of increased domestic surveillance and the broader war on terror, which a lot of uh, people in the United States had issues with in terms of um, privacy concerns and issues of civil liberties. So all of this is to say that uh, the United States ruling class really did need a, a period of respite from what was a burgeoning political crisis, which could have swelled into a real grassroots political opposition. And Barack Obama served as the perfect vehicle for that because in the United States, uh, the uh, black American population has historically been the most progressive on almost every single issue. And so the Obama, the Obama era was really all about neutralizing that sentiment so the movement could remain broadly divided and unable to address the major questions that uh, we were faced with during that 2007-2008 period, the endless runaway uh, financial robbery of banks, the endless wars abroad, these uh, questions of massive and rampant surveillance and incarceration and policing, and just the general economic immiseration of the working class, both in the United States and the world. These were questions that were burning up until uh, Obama came in and became the face of a kinder and gentler imperialism. And many people on the left, most, if not most, I think Black Agenda Report, that's what I read for Black Agenda Report is because I didn't see anyone else telling the truth about this. Either there was a lot of fear or there was actually a real investment in ensuring that he was successful no matter how far he flanked to the right. And we saw how many examples, whether through the expansion of, of the military state into um, like eight wars, the expansion of the drone program, uh, the expansion of military weaponry to U.S. police departments, uh, and also the trillion dollar bailout, the trillions of dollars of bailout money that was given to the banks. All of that uh, became defensible somehow. And that was the genius of Barack Obama. However, it was temporary, and now we're seeing the crisis um, moving in a different direction where Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders kind of represent this new trend and this new uh, challenge to the politics of inclusion, I think, which to me is very interesting. Well, I want to talk about that, but let's first talk about Russia, <laughs> because you have a whole chapter on Russia, and I've done a lot of shows on it and a, live, a lot of live streams, and I think most of my audience does not need to have the Russiagate myth shattered. I think we understand the origins of that, uh, what purposes it served. Um, what's obviously concerning is how many people on the left use talk about it, you know, college educated people on the left still believe it, which shows, you know, how powerful the media is. I wonder if you weren't given some hope uh, last week by the Democratic debates when they said, what was the biggest threat to national security? Now, I was thinking they were going to say Russia and China. And a handful of people said China, and only two people said Russia, but most of them said climate change. And I was really heartened by that because when Bernie Sanders said that four years ago, he was alone in that. I do think that there are millions of people in the United States, and I think the broad swath of younger people, working people generally, are coming to a conclusion that um, the engine of American exceptionalism, which really is the Democratic Party, is totally insufficient and unable to meet the needs that they have 
And so I see Sanders' campaign in that light as a reflection of that in 2016, and how since his demise in 2016, uh, there has been a need for a lot of Democrats to flank in that direction. The, the whole debates to me was an example of how Sanders' political program in 2016 has been co-opted or attempted to be co-opted because I don't think it's necessarily working, but they're trying to co-opt it because they know that if they do not, there will be political consequences, especially in the general election. And so that's how I see it, you know, because of course people like Kamala Harris and um, most of the folks on that debate stage, you know, are very duplicitous and we know what they will do when they're in office. But the fact that they have to say climate change and not China and Russia just shows that uh, there is really not an appetite for war, especially big time wars, because a war with Russia and China is a war that has a possibility to eliminate humanity itself. So uh, there is no appetite for that in the United States among broad swaths of the population, if not the vast majority, other than maybe the 1% um, uh, in, in just sections of the 1%. So we have this scenario where, yes, it is heartening in that sense. But I do think that there is still a lot of work to do because the war machine does not rest. Uh, just because uh, people, uh, candidates on the debate stage are looking to secure votes, they, it's, they're still working um, overtime to create the conditions where such a war is palatable. Well, I don't even think we need to have a war actually to achieve their ends, which is to make profits for the military industrial complex for both the legal, if you will, and the illegal arms dealers. Um, you know, you and I were talking yesterday and I said, I think the reason why the war has shifted from a war on terror, which was Bush's thing, to now China and Russia, is that when you fight terrorists, you're fighting guerrilla warfare in the urban areas or in the jungle, and you don't need, you know, submarines and bombs and all these things. But if you're fighting nuclear powers like Russia and China, then you need to develop these advanced expensive weapon systems. And in my opinion, I don't think they even care if they get used as long as they can um, manufacture them, sell them, amass them. And it's why, you know, these countries that we're still doing business with, you know, we are very selective when we talk about human rights violations. And you have a whole chapter in, in your book about that, about humanitarianism and human rights violations, whereas the biggest perpetrator of human rights violations is Saudi Arabia. But I think there's been some pushback to that. I mean, don't you think that it was progress that Bernie Sanders was able to collaborate with Mike Lee, a Republican in the Senate and Ro Khanna in the House and in, introduce this bill to actually stop the arms sales to you know Saudi Arabia and to say we have to use the War Powers Act and return it to Congress, which they haven't used since 1973? I mean, I'm looking for hope here, <laughs> wherever I can find it. Did you think that was was help, hopeful. I think it is. I think it's a reflection of a, a trend in the United States. Um, you know, despite the fact that uh, traditionally the U.S. population has been easily mobilized into wars in the past, I do think that we're at a stage, especially uh, in terms of the uh, the alignment of forces around the world, where the United States is actually on in decline. So during the beginnings of the war on terror and into the Obama period, uh, the U.S. was still marching as if it were was the uh, number one superpower, that it could do whatever it wanted militarily and there would be no consequences. Well, ironically, the war on terror actually precipitated and intensified the conditions to where that would cease to be. And so part of what I think that effort to um, really uh, roll back a war in Yemen that is so disastrous in terms of its humanitarian consequences that it is a stain on whatever uh, rags that are left of American exceptionalism and its legitimacy. Um, there's also this uh, bigger issue of the fact that Russia and China are ascendant global powers and that they really do represent a check on U.S. military superiority and actually necessitate the United States to invest more in its military in order to supposedly counter it. 
But what we're seeing is that the U.S. is effectively even more restrained. Um, even things like its threats against Iran, Venezuela, become outright internal conflicts in the United States because there is so uh, much doubt about whether the United States can sustain such an effort. Uh, they couldn't, the U.S. couldn't overthrow the Charles in Syria, um, and it definitely is confident in its ability to um, overthrow the government in Iran. So we have a situation where not only is the appetite for war so little in the United States, but also the alignment of forces in the world are actually moving in a direction, not only away from the United States, but also in a direction that makes other countries like Russia and China capable of restraining the endless uh, military um, ventures by the United States. And I think that is what has led. And, you know, you sent me an article about Bernie Sanders' challenging of American exceptionalism this time around in military um, supremacy. And I think a lot of that also is a realization of you can't win a campaign uh, not addressing this question of war in some way. And that's why I think the Yemen question is an obvious one for political purposes, but also for moral and political reasons as well. Well, I thought it was also a hopeful sign when he made, I don't know if you saw his speech on democratic socialism defining what it is, but he made very clear to say, it's not freedom when you can't afford your housing. It's not freedom when you don't have health care or you don't have education. So he's taking these origin myths of what democracy is, freedom and liberty, and because we know we're debt slaves. Um, you talked about it a little bit in your book. One of the most um, influential things I ever saw was this RSA anime by David Harvey called The Crisis of Capitalism. And it showed why between you know World War um, II and 1980, as workers got more product productive, did everybody's standard of living rise? And then why from 1980 to now pretty much, the average wage has not increased and the, the inequality has increased and all the gains have gone to the top 1%. Why have the people not revolted? And the answer was credit because people could live this middle class life on credit. They didn't used to have credit. I remember when I was even little in the 60s, there were no credit cards. If you wanted something that you didn't have the money for, they had layaway. You could put it, you know, some money down and keep putting money, going to the store and keep giving them money. And then when you gave them enough money, you could get the product. Now you can get the product without that. And you can get a house and you can get a car and you can get education. And we're all debt slaves now. So I think when Bernie points out, got to give them pause to say, yeah, am I really free when I'm constantly working until my senior citizen years to pay off the student loans? And if they're not paid off, they're going to take it out of my social security. The maintenance of the living standards that most workers in the United States across racial lines really expect uh, really have been so decimated that credit became a necessity. And now workers in the United States do not even have the ability in any degree. This is just a fact that on capitalism at any stage but it's become permanent, a permanent condition now where workers don't have the means to buy back what they produce at any level, worldwide, especially for the United States in particular as well. So credit has become so influential and that's why finance capital has become so, Wall Street has become so fat because austerity and the need uh, for debt, I mean, look at national debt is an example of this, Household debt is an example of this. Global debt and corporate debt. There's debt everywhere. It's not just the individual. It's um, the entire system is living off the of finance capital because the entire system is in crisis. When workers are becoming poorer and poorer in this race to the bottom, it also affects the top. The top is running away with profits, but they also know it's a delicate, it's a delicate balance between outright financial collapse and the ability to run away with it all. So yes, this is a critical question and a complete um, example of how the myths of American exceptionalism really need to be challenged because it is these myths that prevent us from seeing this reality. It keeps us wanting to remain in the same position that we're in now, or at least um, keep us 
controlled and in a state where we don't feel like we can challenge it because we are so saturated with the endless lies that we're told by the ruling class. Well, I want to, you know, close up here by talking about the solution and what kind of world do you think we need to create and how we're going to get there. Um, you say that the way to get there is to make people aware of who and what is behind these narratives. Um, but like I said before, even college educated leftists still demonize Putin and Russia. I mean, I heard Jane Fonda talking about this. She was one of the biggest activists and she was talking about how, I can't believe I'm believing the CIA and the FBI on Rachel Maddow. It's like she didn't, she commented on it, she observed it, but she didn't question it. And that just goes to show how um, strong the propaganda is. And one of the reasons I think Trump got elected was he promised to get us out of these regime change wars, uh, the ones that we were in and not, as, not get us into new ones. And ever since he's tried to make peace with Kim Jong-un, he's been sabotaged by everybody. And it's not just the Republicans, it's the Democrats, it's the media. I mean, just today, the headline in the LA Times was, oh, he met with him, he crossed into North Korea, first president to cross into North Korea, but they didn't accomplish anything and they're still a dangerous adversary. Okay, so this is a news story. In my mind, characterizing them as a dangerous adversary is editorializing. How do you think we are going to get beyond this propaganda and raise the consciousness? There has to be more rebellion. There has to be more spontaneity. We'll see that come through as the economic conditions gets worse, as the political uh, legitimacy of the two-party system continues to be challenged. We'll see that emerge. Um, We'll see that spontaneity, spontaneity happen. But a lot of it's going to really depend on organization and how us as progressives and leftists organize ourselves and commit to political education. And we hope that our book really serves as a framework to help those efforts so we can begin to study uh, internationalism and movements of the past and learn lessons from them but also learn lessons from the ideologies that continue to infect even the most radical of left political organizations and movements that ha that continue to, as you alluded to, um, reinforce the same myths and narratives of the State Department and the Pentagon and uh, the ruling class generally. We need to challenge that. We need to challenge Russiagate. We need to challenge uh, the fact that uh, it can be viewed as bad that Donald Trump is negotiating with the DPRK or that the corporate media has the audacity to um, question those things so openly and to create a scene where we actually believe that because Donald Trump is bad, that it's bad to um, work with countries abroad like Syria, like the DPRK and like Russia. Uh, but the only way we can do that is by getting organized. And um, I hope, it is my hope, and that this Sanders groundswell that has continued into uh, the 2020 period um, begins to continues to develop into an independent force that uh, doesn't just seek to elect someone like Bernie Sanders into the Democratic Party but starts to realize that the Democratic Party is the engine of American exceptionalism and the engine of capitalism and white supremacy and the system that exists in the United States uh, begins to think about independent forms of organization that may not be as lucrative, may not be, um, uh, may not gain the results right away, but it's what we really need in our workplaces and um, in our uh, communities to really get people involved and get people understanding just how grave the situation is. And lastly, to focus on empire, to focus on empire. That's really what the book was about. American exceptionalism prevents us from doing that. Gets us seeing every country around the world that's not a U.S. imperial partner as an enemy. And when we see other nations like that, who challenge US imperialism in whatever way, we not only miss an opportunity for solidarity and for assistance in our domestic efforts, 
But we also allowed the U.S. war machine to spend all this money on war and to create a situation that will be disastrous and may make all of our efforts all for naught. Now, you pose the um, ideal world where you call it um, solidarity replaces borders, where the U.S. military is not necessary. Now, I think that's going to be a hard place to get to. Um, so I'm wondering if there is some sort of interim step where, you know, kinder, gentler capitalism, if you will. Like if we have the national purpose, as AOC uh, with her Green New Deal talks about a World War II uh, style mobilization against climate change. And of course, that involves green capitalism, which, you know, we know is a problem. Do you think that there's kind of an interim step that we can get to um, that will still sort of involve the profit motive that somebody can make money off of, but not necessarily destroying our planet? Well, I don't see that really existing under the current arrangement of the United States is uh, imperialist and capitalist system. However, what I do see is um, that there needs to be a transition of power. And so the only way that can really occur, though, is through a sharpening of these contradictions and a greater confrontation between the people and the state, uh, working people, press people, people who have material grievances. There needs to be a, a confrontation between the powers that be and uh, the forces of progress. And so, however that occurs, that must be conducted on so many fronts, including, um, which I hope the Sanders uh, phenomenon will eventually lead to, is that very phenomenon, is that very development within the electoral structure, whereby so many people realize that the Democrats are not the answer, that um, there becomes to be a real impetus and a real uh, infrastructure that can develop to uh, create a real political party of working people. The book that we've been discussing is American Exceptionalism, American uh, Innocence, uh, <clears throat> A People's History of Fake News from the Revolutionary War to the War on Terror. And my guest has been Danny Hyphon, who is an activist and a writer for the Black Agenda Report. Well, thank you very much, Danny. It's been a really interesting hour, and I really, really love the book, and I encourage people to buy it. Thank you so much, Lauren. Appreciate it. Okay, good night, everyone.